Napoleon was hard pressed financially and it was proposed uh, to resort to paper money. But he wrote to his minister, while I live, I will never resort to irredeemable paper. He never did. And France, under this determination, commanded all the gold she needed. Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023, Marneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, we're going to look at uh, what would happen if gold and silver traded to zero. <laughs> and by zero, of course, I, I mean the paper prices, the uh, contracts traded on COMEX and the unallocated contracts traded on the LBMA or the London market. Uh, before I start though, uh, today is October 3rd. <laughs> and, and why is that significant? Apart from being my birthday, well, it's uh, German Unity Day. Uh, I remember it used to be called reunification uh, in English. And uh, yes, it was exactly 33 years ago and today's October 3rd. So for those of you who are into numerology and to some theories out there, 33rd anniversary on October 3rd, German reunification. And for those of you who don't know, yes, uh, the German Democratic Republic, that was East Germany, the one that was uh, a satellite of the Soviet Union. And uh, I remember really well the run-up to German reunification. Uh, when the Berlin Wall, wall fell, the Soviet Union imploded. Uh, the whole system just collapsed from within, and, and it was very sudden. No one really expected it. And by 1992, yeah, all, all the Soviet republics had split up from, from, the, from the Russian center, really. And a lot of the problems we see today, uh, especially in Ukraine, is to do with that period. And I'll go through it a little bit. Uh, it was James Baker who was the Secretary of State for George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush the Elder, who, uh, yeah, made an agreement with Edward Shevardnadze, who was the uh, Foreign Minister of the Soviet Union, and their agreement was that the Soviet Union would withdraw all its troops from Eastern Europe and from East Germany. And they did. And the Americans uh, promised, uh, and their documents, I think, archived documents from the U.S. government, uh, they promised that uh, NATO would not expand into, the, into East Germany. And I guess <laughs> the Soviets uh, or the Russians at the time assume that that would be the whole of Eastern Europe. So you could argue now, oh, it was just Germany. It doesn't mean we couldn't expand into Ukraine. And I think that's the whole problem right now. Uh, the whole dispute between NATO and the Russians is because of that. But anyway, uh, to uh, my German viewers, I think there are a few out there. Happy uh, Deutsche Einheit. That's how they, they say it in Germany. And um, yeah, um, I was living back in Switzerland in those days and I'd started working and my bosses were German. So it, it was an interesting period. And uh, it was something that happened very quickly. So um, the way things are going uh, in the West, uh, not just uh, economically, but geopolitically, uh, politically, I think we could have some kind of event like like we had uh, in the old Soviet Union and the uh, Warsaw Pact countries very soon. I'm not sure how it will look like, but it's definitely getting interesting. And uh, another symptom uh, that I'm seeing here, economic malaise, especially in the U.S., it's to do with the uh, bond market and to do with the price of gold uh, and silver. <laughs> yes, they've been hammered uh, in the last week or so, the paper prices. 
And if you uh, don't understand what, what that means by paper price, I, I have a playlist called uh, Gold, uh, Precious Metals uh, Manipulation, and there's loads of videos of, about it. I'm not going to go uh, through the ins and outs here, but suffice it to say, paper price means a derivative. Uh, these prices moving on the screens, they're not people going out there and selling their physical gold to the dealers. It, it's speculators, it, it's uh, central banks, it's uh, treasuries using their uh, exchange stabilization funds to, to hit the uh, contracts on COMEX, to hit the OTC contracts in London, the LBMA, and uh, to drive the price, the drive the price down. It's like um, akin, let's give you akin to, I'll give you an analogy. Let's say it's a really hot day. Uh, it's 40 degrees uh, centigrade or Celsius, which is above 100 Fahrenheit. And uh, someone's made a bet. <laughs> Uh, uh, two people have made a bet and someone said, oh, I bet you the temperature won't go to 40 degrees Celsius today. And uh, so these two people, they're going to go check the uh, thermometer. And the guy who said, I bet you it won't touch 40 degrees, he calls his friend and says, can you go to that thermometer and uh, pick it, <laughs> take it out, put it in some in an ice bucket. Uh, and when we arrive, just put it up there so that it doesn't show that it's 40 degrees. But it's 40 degrees out there. But the thermometer is showing that is back down to 30 and the guy wins the bet. So that's what the gold and silver market are all about. Uh, the paper market. And of course, the other symptom uh, or the other indicator that makes me believe that this manipulation happens because the United States actually would have run out of gold <laughs> uh, many times over by now since 1971 if and because of that they need to keep uh, this thermometer down and why is that well because <laughs> if the thermometer was at a hundred degrees Celsius, we knew we would know that there was something wrong in the world, and it's the same thing for the doll, the, the paper dollar. If the price of gold goes to unimaginable levels, we will know that there's something very wrong with the dollar. A and in my opinion, there is. And I'm gonna uh, show you two indicators that lead me to believe that. The first one is the United States current account, yes, <laughs> the current account they have. Um, in their international dealings with other sovereign nations. And it's been in the red, as you can see here, except for maybe in the uh, early 90s, there's one year there where they had a surplus, but it, it's, a, it, it's a sea of red, as you can see, it's a minus. So what does that mean? Well, <laughs> just think of your own uh, circumstance. If your current account or your checking account, whatever it's called, uh, was always in the red. Would you be able uh, to go out and buy a lot of things? No, not not so. Uh, would you be able to stack gold and silver? No, you have to run a surplus. So that's what I'm trying to say here. A country that's been living beyond its means uh, has no wherewithal. And by country, I, I mean the government, Uncle Sam, the treasury, has no wherewithal to really uh, accumulate any money i.e. gold and silver. The other one I wanted to uh, talk about, and I have to thank, uh, oh boy, I forgot his name now, but uh, yes, Mike Maloney. <laughs> uh, I, I watch him once in a while, not very often, but he did a video recently and he looked at the US debt clock, which we look at a lot, of course. But one thing he noticed that is really worrying is not the debt itself, because <laughs> we know the debt is racking up more and more, <laughs> higher and higher. We're at 33 trillion, 155 billion right now. But I think the most worrying thing that shows that uh, the rising treasury yields 
is not a sign of economic strength, but a sign of fiscal, a huge fiscal trouble ahead for the United States. It's the uh, U.S. federal tax revenue. <laughs> if you look at the number carefully here, it's going down. So it means <laughs> the, the government is getting less and less tax revenue and its deficit it's running deficits uh, of two trillion or more. That's very worrying because uh, the debt is going up and the tax revenue is going down. That's a, a really bad combination. Income tax revenue as well is going down. So that's a sign that the economy uh, is not doing well. And I've covered this uh, in other videos recently about the U.S. yield curve. And uh, I, I said that uh, whenever the, the spread between the two year and the 10 year gets back to zero because it's been inverted, that, that's a sign in the last 30 years that there's always a crisis and a recession. And right now we've gone from being minus, over 100 inverted, we're now approaching 40. And I think that could move very quickly. And, and I think it's all going to be on the back, mostly on the back of the 10-year yield continuing to rise. So that's why uh, I think, uh, yeah, gold could go to zero, as I said. Uh, let, let's have a look here uh, why I'm talking about this. Well, there's a guy on uh, Twitter. He's called Financialot. He's got a lot of followers, 113,000, and uh, he tweeted this uh, clip here of uh, Rick, uh, what's his name, Rick Santelli. He's he's a good uh, analyst, I would say, Rick Santelli. Uh, I don't watch CNBC, but he was talking actually about the 10-year yield, that it could go to 13% in the next few years. And I don't disagree with him. And it's mostly because of the uh, fiscal situation of the U.S., of course, because one of the viewers said, oh, is that because the economy is doing so well? And he said, no. Uh, but then this finance a lot uh, said here, this is what he said. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. If rates go go this high, it will destroy the gold market like the 1980s and cause a debt collapse outside of the U.S., securing the dollar's position as the global reserve currency. I think he's got it totally wrong, and that's why I replied to him, and I got 137 likes. As you can see, I said gold has been around for thousands of years, so I, I think the fiat dollar will be the one destroyed in 1981, which was the period that he was talking about um, when uh, the 10-year yield went up to almost 16%, I said in 1981, debt to GDP was around 35%, and there was, no, and there was zero over-the-counter derivatives. So I think he's wrong. <laughs> if uh, Treasury yields continue to rise like this, uh, it's going to slow down the economy. Tax revenue is going to drop even quicker. And I urge you to check the U.S. debt clock. <laughs> it is going down, the ta uh, tax revenue and income tax revenue. And what that will do, it will force the U.S. Treasury to start borrowing money to pay the interest on the debt. The interest is going to balloon because... They're going to be issuing more debt to pay the old debt at a higher rate, and it's going to be a disaster. So what about gold going down to zero? Well, back in 2008, gold dropped from uh, 1000 in March when uh, Bear Stearns had to, had to be uh, saved by JP Morgan and the Fed. Basically, that's what it was. Uh, it, it hit 1,031. I remember that day. And that was the top, uh, short-term top. And then by the time Lehman collapsed, gold had dropped to below, just below 700 to around 680. And uh, it, it was hit hard during that period. Uh, yeah, September, October 
a, a little bit like like this here. But I remember uh, sitting at work and talking to friends, and I was ready uh, buying gold at the time, and I'd gotten a lot of my colleagues to to get involved in, in gold, and we're calling uh, the dealer. <laughs> we're actually calling John Haynes, who's a jeweler, but he he had the best prices for sovereigns, and uh, the premiums were like 10, 15 percent if you could get gold. So what I'm trying to say here. People are not stupid. It, it, it's like uh, what happened with oil back in uh, 2020. Why did oil go negative? Uh, well, first of all, it was in Brent. It was WTI crude, West Texas Intermediate. And the contract, the futures contract, again, a contract, not real oil, specifies that uh, WTI crude has to be delivered to to the warehouse where they store it in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, I forgot the name of the place now. Um, I'll remember it. But anyway, because of lockdowns and all the disruption and, and everything, uh, the uh, storage places were shut down. So a lot of people that had oil they needed to store for delivery in uh, Oklahoma, they couldn't. So they were trying to get rid of it <laughs> and uh, they had to pay people to take their oil for them. And that's why the price went to minus $37.50. Would you really want to pay someone or let someone have your gold uh, for zero or for, for a price that you know is completely fake? I wouldn't. So what I would say is that um, Mr. Finance a lot might be right. <laughs> they might be able to drive the price of paper, gold and silver a lot lower. But I, I would say China and uh, Singapore and all the other Eastern and Global South countries, what they're going to do is they're going to load up on it. Uh, and uh, we uh, peons, <laughs> uh, retail people, will probably not be able to get any physical. So, and when these things happen, they happen very quickly. They don't last a long time. Just like thirty-seven dollars uh, fifty negative oil didn't last long. Just like six hundred and seventy dollar gold in two thousand eight didn't last long. <laughs> uh, it, it was very short lived. And uh, before we look at the markets today, I, I just want to reference Fiat Money Inflation in France. And I highly recommend this book. Uh, you can find it online, a free PDF. And I've gone over it many times. And I'm going to go uh, through the passage here towards the end of the book uh, about this period and what happened. Uh, so here we go. But this history would be incomplete without a brief sequel showing how the great genius profited, profited by all his experience. When Bonaparte, that's Napoleon, took the consulship, the condition of fiscal affairs was appalling. The government was bankrupt. An immense debt was unpaid. The further collection of taxes seemed impossible. The assessments were in hopeless confusion. War was going on in the East, on the Rhine and in Italy, in civil war in La Vendée. All the armies had long been unpaid, and the largest loan that could be, for the moment, uh, be affected was for some hardly meeting the expenses of the government for a single day. At the first cabinet council, Bonaparte was asked what he intended to do. He replied, I will pay cash or pay nothing. <laughs> and by cash, he meant gold and silver coin. From this time, he conducted all his operations on this basis. He arranged the assessments, funded the debt, and made payments in cash. And from this time, during all the campaigns of Marengo, Austerlitz, Jena, Eilau, Friedland, down to the peace of uh, 
Tilsit in 1807, there was but one suspension of specie payment. Yet yeah, again, specie is gold and silver coin, real money. And this was only for a few days. When the first great European coalition was formed against the empire, Napoleon was hard pressed financially and it was proposed uh, to resort to paper money. But he wrote to his minister, while I live, I will never resort to irredeemable paper. He never did. And France, under this determination, commanded all the gold she needed. When Waterloo came with the invasion of the Allies, with war on her own soil, with a, charge, with a change of dynasty, and with heavy expenses for war and indemnities, France, on a specie basis, experienced no severe financial distress. So there you go. That's how important gold and silver are. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the man who was supposed to was the big enemy of uh, the Allies hated irredeemable paper. So is it any wonder that the BRICS and others are, are buying gold? I, I, I think they see the writing on the wall for the U.S. dollar, the, the fiat dollar, the irredeemable dollar. So... There you go. <laughs> With that, let's quickly look at where the markets are this morning. Uh, it's 8.41 a.m. London time. We'll look at the paper price of gold and silver. Well, gold is at 18.22. It's down $5. The low has been 18.15. The high has been 18.30. And I think last year, uh, gold closed around these levels. So we're pretty much unchanged for the year right now. And, and I think uh, I don't want to predict bottoms but um, usually they come overnight like uh, when the US is closed and London uh, is closed as well like overnight for London and when Asia is open and it's interesting that this week is golden week so the the Chinese market is very quiet so what better what better week to come and uh, put the uh, thermometer in a nice bucket right <laughs> so you don't lose the bet and I think uh, I, I, I'll go out on the limb and say that I, I think the bottom is in for silver. And why is that? Well, because we traded as low as 2067 overnight and now we're at 2102. And I think if we uh, are able to close above 2130 or 2150, that will be uh, a good signal. And why is that? Well, because this long-term chart here, as you can see, uh, 20, 20, that level around 2120 was a key resistance many years ago. So uh, that's how I see it. Uh, silver right now is trading at 21. It's down four cents. As I said, the low is 26.67 and the high is 21.15. Dow futures is uh, up 17. NASDAQ is up 12. S&P is up four. Not much going on there. The currencies as well, I'll actually not go through them. They're virtually unchanged. The dollar did get almost up to 150 versus the yen. I think the high was 149.94. Uh, what about the other currencies? Uh, the uh, Aussie dollar is uh, down two thirds of a percent. So Aussie's quite weak, 63.20. Uh, the dollar is up 0.2 versus the Canadian dollar at 137. And the Kiwi dollar is also down two thirds uh, of a percent, 59.05. What about the uh, commodities? Well, huh, WTI crude uh, was hit hard yesterday. So, yeah, we're continuing to go down here. We're at 87.60, down, uh, down about 40 cents. And uh, Brent is just uh, below 90 down about half a percent as well. High-grade copper is down 1% at 361.62. So yeah, a, a, a lot of these commodities are getting hit hard. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe there's some trouble ahead. Uh, and that, that wouldn't be surprising with, uh, with yields rising so sharply. Uh, we've got the 10-year yield right now holding below 470. That's the high overnight. 
Right now we're at 469, it's unchanged. Uh, UK yields are creeping back up as well. We're trading around 5% for the two year. The 30 year uh, is trading around 504. So with that, I'm gonna wish you all a very good day. Take care, bye.